Hello, and welcome to the Pulse of the Indo-Pacific. I'm Jeff Smith, a research fellow here at the Heritage Foundation, and I have with me today Alexander Gray, a senior fellow in National Security Affairs at the American Foreign Policy Council, my old think tank. Um, prior to his role at AFPC, uh, Alex served in the Trump administration as deputy assistant to the president and chief of staff of the National Security Council. He was also special assistant to the president for the defense industrial base at the White House National Economic Council. And perhaps most important for this conversation, he was the first ever director for Oceana and Indo-Pacific security at the NSC with responsibility for Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. And lastly, uh, what seems like ages ago, when I first met Alex, uh, he was a senior advisor to former Congressman Randy Forbes, who was a key leader uh, on the Armed Services Committee. And so Alex brings a wealth of experience uh, to the table on, frankly, a wide range of issues. Uh, but since this is the pulse of the Indo-Pacific, um, I was hoping we could focus our discussion today mostly on the Pacific Islands. Um, this is widely recognized as an area of emerging strategic significance, uh, but one that's been a relative blind spot for Washington as a whole, right. uh, for myself, even for many Indo-Pacific watchers. Um, as the first NSC director dedicated to Oceana, uh, I thought you'd be perfect to help sort of shepherd this discussion along and get, get us up to speed on what's been happening in the region. So maybe uh, to start, you could help sort of set the scene for us and just drill down a little bit on the basics. Where are the Pacific Islands? What are the Pacific Islands? How are they organized? And why are they increasingly important to US foreign policy? Well, thanks so much for having me, Jeff. This is uh, great to be here and to have this conversation with you. And I think what we're, we're seeing is the Pacific Islands, you're right, they're becoming more uh, in the attention of, of folks in Washington. And part of that is because they're, they're more uh, part of the equation geopolitically. They're, they never went away. We're a Pacific power. We've always been a Pacific power. But in the last uh, five years or so, we've seen that as part of the great power competition with China, China's focus has increasingly gravitated towards what I, I term the second island chain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, as we think about what that is, the second island chain is really uh, three subregions. It's Micronesia in the North Pacific. So that's Marshall Islands, Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and depending on how you define it, potentially Kiribati and Nauru. Um, it's Polynesia, which is Samoa, uh, it's uh, the island of Tuvalu. It's um, parts of uh, part some of the French dependencies in the in the region, uh, and then it's Melanesia, which is Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. Uh, and depending on how you define it, Tonga could be Melanesia or Polynesia. So those are really kind of the the key groupings in the Pacific Islands, the second island chain. And that's where we've seen so much increased activity geopolitically, diplomatically, economically. Uh, and that's that's those are areas where there's a lot uh, for the United States and our partners to kind of expand how we're thinking about the region and to, and to give them a little more engagement and attention. Hmm. So uh, as I noted at the outset, you were the first NSC okay. director yeah. for Oceana and Indo-Pacific Security uh, at, the, at the NSC. What prompted the decision to create this office? Uh, was it recognition of change in the region? Was there a single catalyzing event? And has, has the office been retained in the Biden administration? Yeah. So it's interesting. So all credit is due to our friend Matt Pottinger, yeah. who at the time was senior director for Asia at the NSC. And um, Matt you know, tells a great story about how uh, when he came into the White House, he was told, you know, don't worry, the Pacific Islands are not something that you really need to focus on. Hmm. Um, and and he, he has a great uh, map where he, he, in his office, and, you know, he, he had this huge area of responsibility stretching for you know, China, Japan, South Korea. He had directors to cover all of them. And then he had uh, on the map, all of the Pacific Islands were being uh, taken care of, but the same person who was doing Japan and Australia and New Zealand. And so this vast swath of territory covered by one human being. Uh, and Matt 
over his course of his time as senior director, started watching more and more interest in the Pacific Islands by our competitor, by China. Mm -hmm. And whether it was looking at naval bases, uh, publicly reported interest in naval bases in Vanuatu, in Papua New Guinea, in Fiji, uh, efforts to move Taiwan's diplomatic recognition uh, in places like the Solomons and Kiribati. And he was watching this just drumbeat of activity from Beijing with one staffer who's also handling Japan, who's also handling Australia, trying to manage all of this. And so Matt uh, reached out to me and he said, hey, you know, we've got this big swath of the Indo-Pacific that's radically uncovered. Would you step in and help us kind of devise a policy approach to this really vital region? Uh, and I said, absolutely. And uh, that's, there we are. Well, you talked a little bit about why our attention was being drawn toward the Pacific Islands. China, I think, is uh, safe to say was at least one of the factors. Yeah. What exactly is it that China has been doing there that we find so concerning? So, you know, I always say the Pacific Islands, um, we need to treat the relationship with the Pacific Islands uh, as standalone relationships. They're not just about China. It's not just about any one outside force. Um, we have all sorts of bilateral interests with various countries in the region. Take uh, the freely associated states, Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and, and Palau. They, they serve in the United States military. As a percentage of their population, citizens of those three countries serve at a higher percentage in the US military than any state in the United States. So we have very important, strategic, unique relationships, people to people with, with these countries that transcend China. So I think that's important to, to know. It's, it should not all be viewed as China competition. That being said, China, like I mentioned, they're making a huge effort to expand their reach into the islands. And they're doing it in a couple ways. They're doing it uh, diplomatically, so they have representation and embassies in almost all the Pacific Island countries. Mm. Um, some of those diplomatic representations are, I think, classic wolf warrior diplomacy. They're, they're heavy handed, they're aggressive, they're projecting Chinese interests and power in very overt and in some cases uh, meddling ways. Uh, a great example of that, trying to switch recognition from Taiwan, which when I took that portfolio, six Pacific Island countries recognized Taiwan instead of China, it's now four. Mm. And the Chinese, through diplomatic means, economic means, uh, cultural and, and influence operations means, were able to move Kiribati and the Solomon Islands in 2019 from recognizing Taipei to Beijing. And we're seeing now in the Solomons, which maybe we'll talk about, we're seeing some of the, the after effects of those types of strategic decisions that Beijing has influenced. But we're also seeing economic repercussions, and we're seeing uh, Beijing through the Belt and Road Initiative uh, working to, to get concessions in things like the logging industry and, and fishing. We're seeing them attempting to buy ports. Um, obviously, we have some real concerns about what that means if the Chinese have concessions at, at major ports. It's not a far stretch to go from a civilian port to a dual use facility, to potentially a military facility. Um, so, so we're seeing a really broad array of, of Chinese tools of statecraft being used in these countries. And remember, Jeff, th these are tiny countries in some instances. These are countries with populations of, some, in some instances, 10,000, 12,000 people. And when the Chinese come in with uh, all of these tools in their toolkit, it's an extremely, um, uh, destabilizing force in some instances uh, because they, they don't come in oftentimes with the, the uh, interests of the island's citizenry in mind. They're projecting Chinese and CCP uh, strategic and political objectives. And that, that can be, take for instance, some of on the economic front, when they're coming in with some of these large infrastructure projects, by the time the Chinese are done, you have a very high debt to GDP ratio that's left in their wake, uh, much as you see in Southeast Asia and as, as you see in uh, uh, the Indian Ocean region. So there's a lot of, I think, potentially negative and damaging consequences to some of that engagement. Hmm. And uh, you did talk about some of the success China has seen in terms of switching rec recognition. Mm -hmm. Certainly their influence has been expanding. Um, their footprint on the ground has been expanding. Has it been 
universally effective or are we seeing some pushback? Are there some concerns uh, yeah. about Chinese presence in the region and some effort to bring the U.S. back in? Where I imagine it's a mixed bag in the region. Yeah. It's absolutely a mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, you have places like Vanuatu, which have been very heavily influenced by China, and where uh, you've had successive governments in Vanuatu that are very much now, uh, through the amount of debt they've had to accrue because of the type of high-profile infrastructure that's been, been rendered, um, very closely integrated with China's ambitions and objectives. You have places like the Solomon Islands now because of what, what happened with the switch in recognition, you now have China exerting a lot of control over Prime Minister Sogavari's government. And, and there's a lot of economic intertwining. Uh, people have argued there's a lot of political corruption that's been engendered by more Chinese influence uh, governmentally and economically. So some places there's success. Other places, not at all. Um, you look at Palau, for instance. President Whips from Palau is someone who has very vocally said he will never switch recognition from Taiwan to, to China. He's traveled to Taiwan. He's, he's actually gone uh, during COVID and he brought the US ambassador to Palau with him to Taiwan. I mean, so we, we and, and he said publicly that everything he sees from China is corruption, is political interference, uh, negative impacts, and, and he has said he will never endorse that for the people of Palau. We've seen the same thing in the Marshall Islands, very strong opposition to closer relationships with China. Uh, and we've also seen in Samoa, independent Samoa, um, where the previous prime minister had been extremely supportive of China's uh, further integration into the country, we actually saw a political backlash to that and the election of a new prime minister who's promised to relook at some of the big BRI infrastructure projects in Samoa. So there's definitely the opportunity for the U.S. and its partners to make a case that Chinese influence has a lot of negatives attached to it. Um, and I think we're beginning to see some of those trends in different parts of the region. Yeah, in doing research for this conversation, I saw that there was uh, this summer reports that the Federated States of Micronesia uh, was open to a more frequent and permanent U.S. armed forces presence. Right. Uh, and to cooperate on how that presence will be built up both temporarily and permanently. Uh, the Palau president sent a letter to the U.S. Secretary of Defense last year requesting the U.S. to build uh, joint use military facilities. Um, are there prospects for new U.S. military facilities in the region? Is there appetite yeah. and interest on both sides for that? Well, let's talk a little bit about the two countries you mentioned plus uh, Marshall Islands. So those are the freely associated states. They have compacts of free association, COFAs with the United States, and they have uh, Palau since the early 90s, the others going back to the 70s and 80s. And what COFAs are is they're, they're agreements, uh, not formal treaties, but they're agreements between the US and those three countries that do a couple things. They allow the U.S. unrestricted military access to those countries, and we're required to undertake their defense. Um, so airspace, uh, water, land, we have unrestricted access. As importantly, we have the right of denial. We can deny any other country access to that same space. Um, militarily, if you look at where these islands are located, going back to World War II and before, these are in the North Central Pacific. They're very critical hubs between Hawaii, the West Coast, and East Asia. So the U.S. having that both denial and access rights to those islands is absolutely essential. We already have some military installations in the freely associated states. We have on Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands, we have a key uh, Air Force installation, but uh, some missile sites. We have in Palau a new radar site that's going up. We have uh, uh, military personnel that rotate in and out for a variety of reasons on a regular basis. Uh, we do port calls on a regular basis. So there's absolutely a huge U.S. need as we think about a broader presence in the Indo-Pacific, particularly as Guam becomes a site of more and more U.S. military activity, dispersing some of that over a broader area makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of political appetite, I think that, you know, like every other country, there's going to be factions within each country that have different views of, of the United States, different views of the U.S. military presence. 
I will say, if you look at other countries in the region, uh, there is no larger uh, appetite and support for enhanced U.S. military presence than in those three freely associated states. One caveat to that, the compacts of free association are coming up for renewal. Mm. And we have a huge, huge opportunity to get those done quickly, uh, to get them done in, in a way that, that shows our commitment to them. So not a lot of haggling, not a lot of wasted time with bureaucracy. Uh, we started the process under President Trump. The Biden administration is continuing it. Um, unfortunately, it seems to have ground to a little bit of a halt during COVID, getting the, the renewals done. Um, I would say from a U.S. perspective, there is no larger policy objective right now than getting those compacts renewed. Really critical. And what is the deadline for renewal on those roughly? Palau was actually renewed several years late in 2018, 2019. Uh, the others come up for renewal in the uh, next two years or so. Okay. So we've got a little bit of time, but they have to go through the U.S. Congress. So really, we have to get them negotiated, and then we have to get them through Congress. And so we're still in the negotiation phase, and we need to get that wrapped up soon. Is the uh, nuclear legacy issue part of what's holding up negotiations uh, with, with the, does that become a sticking point with the Marshall Islands? So with the Marshall Islands, it is complicated because that, that's the site of Bikini Atoll and some of the places where we did testing in the 40s and 50s. Um, there, there is a legacy there. And it's, it's not just the material issues. There's a moral and there's a historical and cultural issue at, at stake. And you know, I, I take the position I did when I was in, in government, I take it now, that the U.S. really has a moral obligation to work through this in a way that takes accountability for some of the things we did, not just the testing itself, but also how we responded to the concerns the islanders had in the years afterwards. And we didn't always uh, approach it with the greatest sensitivity and respect. Now, with 50, 60 years dif uh, distance, we have that ability to, to do that. And I think my biggest concern strategically is that if we don't get a handle on that moral issue and we don't address it in a forthright way, we're going to very quickly cede propaganda points to the CCP mm -hmm. who are looking and waiting to find a way to call our commitment to the marshals into question. And so we really have to get this resolved uh, in a way that, that shows that we're, we're not just in this for our own advantage, we're also looking out for the Marshall Islands and, and their interests as well. Well said. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about other influential actors in the Oceana. Uh, the French seem to be a significant mm -hmm. player in, in the Pacific Islands. Earlier this year, French President Macron uh, said he in, intended on launching a network of, of coast guards for the South yep. Pacific. Um, why is France such an important uh, economic player, economic and geopolitical player in the region? And is there room to work together with them for shared outcomes? So France, of course, has two uh, overseas departments in the region. They have New Caledonia near Australia and New Zealand, and they have French Polynesia to the uh, far east. And both of those, they have a permanent military presence in both. They actually have pretty considerable air and naval assets in both, uh, both of the, the overseas departments. Um, the French have been extremely useful to us in terms of and useful to the region. ISR, uh, helping to combat illegal and unreported fishing. Um, they, they have a great intelligence network in the region. Uh, they have a historical presence there going back, in some cases, two centuries now. So there's a lot that the French can be doing to support us in the islands and vice versa. Um, I, I wrote an op-ed where I said the French need to come in and start pre-positioning additional naval assets to include an their Mistral-class amphibious ship. Um, we need to have that on a semi-permanent basis in the region, uh, New Caledonia or French Polynesia, to help project uh, allied and, and partner power farther afield. Um, they could be a huge, huge force multiplier particularly now post uh, AUKUS, it would be great to see them really double down on what they already have uh, in that part of the, the region. And what about um, some of the other actors uh, like Australia and potentially even Taiwan? Yeah. What, what role can Taiwan play in the region? So obviously Australia and New Zealand are really the traditional U.S. partners in, that, in the Pacific Islands, Second Island chain. Australia and New Zealand have um, historical legacies of having been 
mandatory powers in Solomon Islands, in Papua New Guinea, uh, in parts of in Samoa, in parts of Polynesia. So there, there's a complex historical legacy that both of them have with various islands. But they also have tremendous cultural ties. So New Zealand, um, somewhat, uh, there's a great line that Auckland, New Zealand, is actually the largest Polynesian city in the world. Mm -hmm. They have a tremendous Polynesian diaspora that lives in New Zealand. They have their foreign minister um, is, a, is a Maori, and obviously the Maoris have a lot of uh, cultural affinity and ties with the people of the Pacific Islands. So there's really a huge opportunity for New Zealand and Australia to, to play big roles in the region, and they do. Um, one of my concerns in government and now is that the U.S. often uh, outsources too much of our bilateral relationships with different islands to Australia and New Zealand. Doesn't mean they aren't huge resources, huge partners, but we have to have bilateral relationships with every single country in the region. We don't have an embassy in the Solomon Islands. We don't have an embassy in Vanuatu. Um, we rely on Australia and New Zealand for a big part of, of our intelligence, our diplomatic representation in these countries. And it means that you know, our peculiar interests are not always being represented and looked out for. So as much as these partnerships are really important, um, you know, one of the things I, I think that we have to make as a major agenda item for this administration and the next one is building U.S. diplomatic facilities in places like Solomon Islands, in places like Vanuatu, um, having a larger U.S. intelligence presence in even islands like Kiribati and, and Nauru, where we just don't have a good feel for the, the on-the-ground relationships and what's happening. To your question on Taiwan, yeah. Um, so ta Taiwan, as I said, four diplomatic partners left in the region: uh, Tuvalu, Nauru, uh, Marshall Islands, and Palau. Really, really important development partners for all of them. Uh, healthcare, education, cultural exchanges, uh, even in places like uh, Marshall Islands, they do a lot of um, they'll do a lot of education exchanges for. Uh, senior members of parliament and, and I mean really great long-standing uh, partners for these islands. What I think um, Taiwan has struggled with is they don't do the type of large infrastructure projects the way BRI offers. And some of these uh, developing countries really want to see the big ticket roads and bridges and, and water treatment facilities. And that's not necessarily how Taiwan conducts its development partnerships. So that's an area where I think building a coalition with the United States, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, France, the UK, we can offer a more uh, collaborative approach to building that type of infrastructure so that that's a, a uh, counterpart to BRI and offers a, a positive alternative. That's actually a, a great segue into my, my next question, which is uh, we tend to view most developments through the lens of US-China geopolitical competition. Um, from the perspective of the islanders, what is important to them? Yeah. What would they like to see more of out of the U.S. and yeah. partners and allies? It sounds like infrastructure, economic development is a big yeah. part of it. Um, right. Are there others? Well, so the you know I think one of the as we think about how we should be interacting with the Pacific Islands, you know, there's certainly going to be there's a geopolitical lens, and uh, I, I'm writing a book about this. The, the U.S. has a history going back to almost the founding of our republic of looking at the Pacific Islands strategically in a very specific way, kind of as stepping stones, to quote John Quincy Adams, between the west coast of the U.S. and China. Mm -hmm. And that's been reinforced by World War II, by the Cold War, and now this competition with China. There's, there's a military dimension, a diplomatic dimension. That being said, we have to have bilateral relationships that are grounded in the unique needs of the specific countries. They're not grounded in how we view the geography of these countries. So when you think about what the Pacific Islands value, it's infrastructure, it's people-to-people uh, -people relationships, it's um, things like healthcare, it's resilience to the natural disasters that they face in the region. So they're, they're in a typhoon, very uh, area prone to typhoons. We have to be offering them the type of assistance that, that really the United States is expert at of how do you mitigate floods? How do you mitigate sea level rises? How do you mitigate uh, invasive species? How, all those sorts of things that affect their day-to-day -day lives, 
we can really be a positive partner in that way. Um, and, and so it's speaking the language that appeals to the hearts and minds of the people in those islands, rather than talking in kind of esoteric, geographic, strategic terms. That's how we're gonna build the long lasting relationships that also serve some of our, our more strategic purposes. Hmm. Uh, last question on the Pacific Islands. We've seen uh, some unrest in the Solomon Islands, rioting, uh, mm -hmm. and assault on government buildings, right. uh, talk of sending uh, troops to provide security and stability. What's the source of this uh, violence and instability, and is it related at all to the decision to switch recognition? Well, it's a complicated situation. Solomon's has a, a history of, of civil unrest and had a, a horrible civil war that ended uh, about a decade and a half ago. Uh, there was a long-standing mission that Australia had called the Ramsey Mission that was uh, there as a peacekeeping force. Um, it, really, there's a lot of ethnic and, and uh, societal cleavages in the Solomon's. Um, the most populous province, Malaita, uh, is run by a gentleman named Daniel Sudani, who's a great friend of Taiwan and who has repeatedly tried to keep relations between his province and Taiwan and who feels very strongly that China offers a, uh, a negative path, not just for his province, but for the Solomons writ large. So there is certainly an angle here. Uh, some of the, the uh, folks who are engaging in civil unrest were from Malaita, we're told, uh, some were not. There are a variety of different, you know, on the ground issues, there's certainly one of the bigger picture concerns is this lingering sense that the switch to China from Taiwan offers the wrong path for the Solomons. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that that's the only cause of it, but certainly that exacerbated some of the existing societal cleavages that we've seen. And while I have you here, and we have just a minute or two left, I did wanna ask you uh, an off topic question. Uh, you wrote an op-ed recently for the Wall Street Journal um, in which you said for the fifth year in a row, China, with Russian assistance, used an international forum to prevent the establishment of new marine protected areas along the coast of Antarctica. Beijing is increasingly interested in the southern continent and for all the wrong reasons. Uh, why is it interested in Antarctica and what is it doing there? So this is an issue that uh, I came across in my role doing the Pacific Islands at the NSC because New Zealand and Australia have traditionally been kind of our eyes and ears in Antarctica. Um, and, and they're very much concerned about this development. Essentially, we, we operate under the Antarctic Treaty from 1961, which says that Antarctica is to be a place essentially a national park for everyone. There's no military activity, there's no extractive mining, there's no commercial economic activity. It's to be preserved for science. Unfortunately, what we've seen in the last uh, several years is China has been increasingly using its presence, they have five research stations in Antarctica, including very close to the South Pole, to do uh, activities that are not acceptable under the treaty. So we now know that they supply um, People's Liberation Army officers are now working in their, their scientific bases and they're not disclosing, as the treaty requires, that they're there. So that's a very big concern. Um, they're building uh, runways, they're building uh, nuclear-powered icebreakers that really facilitate their, their uh, access to the continent. Um, we have concerns about the type of activity that's going on in these bases. And one of the biggest concerns is under the treaty, all the signatories are allowed to inspect each other's bases to ensure compliance with, with what I just mentioned. Um, the U.S. and its partners have really been derelict in doing those inspections for the last several years. So there are key Chinese bases, including very southern ones uh, near the South Pole, which obviously has, from a scientific and military perspective, there's a lot of value in having a base situated at the magnetic South Pole. Uh, we have no idea what's going on in those bases. And so the United States, because our icebreaker fleet has atrophied, our ability to conduct uh, air, uh, uh, send in uh, polar outfitted uh, C-130s has atrophied. We are really struggling to conduct the inspections and to do the due diligence that we need. So that's raised a lot of concerns. Um, the other issue we have from an environmental and economic perspective, there's a protocol that's an addendum to the Antarctic Treaty that prohibits any sort of, of uh, mining on the continent. 
We've recently seen Chinese analysts and officials speculating about how mineral-rich rare earth elements, critical minerals, uh, Antarctica might be. Um, as part of that, they've been speculating that the, this protocol expires in 2049. No Western analyst or legal scholar believes that to be the case, but we've seen the slow drumbeat of once that expires, China will have an opportunity to begin exploring and potentially extracting from the continent. Um, I think as, as someone who you, you follow Chinese economic activity all over the world, this strikes a lot of us as something that's a, 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 pre, a predicate for additional Chinese malign activity to try and get at potentially untapped resources and in the process damaging what's the last true wilderness on earth. Um, and that, that really strikes me as something that we need to be speaking out against as a country and in concert with Australia and New Zealand much more aggressively. That's why I wrote the piece. Well, thank you for writing that article and thanks for coming in today and taking this tour of the Pacific Islands with us. Thank you for your service and I would love to have you back again uh, maybe next year and we'll see how things are going in Oceana. Thanks for having me, Jeff.